So I wanted to start off with a couple of announcements. First off, I hope everyone is staying health, healthy and safe in this time with the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we do understand how this outbreak is impacting municipalities across the country, as well as the day-to-day -day activities of municipal services and staff. So given this rapidly evolving situation, um, William Shia from Toronto Water is actually unable to join us today for the webinar. But we are fortunate to have Carl Yates, a retired general manager from Halifax Water and the president of his consulting firm, step in today to provide a municipal water utility perspective to the conversation. So I'll speak more about his extensive bio a little bit later. Another note is to please bear with us today if there are any minor technical glitches. We do have a slightly different logistical setup today, um, so we do appreciate your patience with us. I'll start by introducing myself if you haven't attended the previous sessions of the series. Um, my name is Juliana Fanus and I'm a project coordinator for the Green Municipal Fund at the Federation of Canadian Municipalities. We're back today with the last session of our series. Each week we've been covering a different sector and today we're gonna be ending the series by learning about opportunities in municipal water management, which is actually quite fitting given that World Water Day is coming up this Sunday, March 22nd. Although the webinar is offered in English, the audience is also welcome to ask questions in French. And if you do have colleagues that are missing today's webinar, the session is being recorded and should be available on FCM's YouTube channel in a few weeks. In case you haven't attended the previous sessions, I'm just gonna go quickly through uh, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities mandate and the Green Municipal Fund. So the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, also known as FCM, is the national voice of municipal government with diverse programs and services that are designed to support municipalities. Our largest program is the Green Municipal Fund, also known as GMF, which is an over a $1 billion program funded by the Government of Canada to support municipal efforts to improve air, water, and soil quality. So our fund has a double mission to support municipal initiatives in sustainable development through funding, but also to share knowledge and lessons learned through online resources and tools, through trainings, peer learning activities, and networking opportunities. GMF is currently available for projects in five sectors. We have energy performance, waste reduction, brownfields, transportation, and water performance, um, of which I'll briefly talk about at the end. And we have a number of useful highlights for you. If you want to learn a little bit more about the initiatives that we funded, our approved projects database is a wealth of resources on our funded projects, including case studies, reports, contact information, and more. So I'd encourage you to take a look at the link we just sent in the chat box. We're gonna be sending a few your way, so keep an eye out. You should also subscribe to our weekly newsletter, FCM Connect, for the latest updates on funding, training, and what we have to offer. We also strongly encourage you to apply for FCM's 2020 Sustainable Communities Award. Given the COVID-19 pandemic, we've extended the deadline by one month to Thursday, April 30th. So if you're planning on applying beyond the original deadline, which was March 31st, please contact awards at fcm.ca to confirm your intent to apply. It's a really great opportunity since these awards recognize Canada's most innovative local sustainability projects in nine different categories. So take a quick look. Which also reminds me, as of now, we're still on to host our 2020 Sustainable Communities Conference taking place October 20th to 22nd in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, it is an opportunity for, for us to celebrate GMF's 20th anniversary and the program should deliver some really relevant content that brings some insights to your community challenges. If we were to take a quick look into some of the water management issues um, that you, some of you are facing, which we've taken from the respond responses from the survey, we can see that some of you are struggling to balance a number of growing priorities in your communities, including infrastructure, assets, services, data, funding, among others. So we're looking forward to having the presenters dive into some of these topics a little bit further. Today's webinar is the last of a five-part webinar series that were initially intended to demonstrate and showcase how Canadian communities are tackling their environmental challenges by launching innovative initiatives across each of GMF's five sectors. In today's session, 
we learn about key factors and drivers that are affecting existing and emerging water management trends, as well as leading edge best practices that have high triple bottom line benefits and a strong potential to transform municipal activities. The report uh, for water in collaboration with the Canadian Water Network is now available. So we'll be sending a link in the chat box for that. And today's session will actually shed light into some of those key findings from the research, offer a municipal water utility perspective. And at the very end of the session, like I mentioned earlier, we'll go through a few GMF funding opportunities for the water stream. We're fortunate today to be joined by two panelists. We have Bernadette Conant from Canadian Water Network and Carl Yates from Yates Water Management. Thank you both for joining us today. And before I turn the floor over to you, just a few housekeeping items. Bernadette will present for 15 minutes, followed by Carl, leaving about 15 minutes or so for questions and a few minutes for a quick funding overview. Please send us your questions through the questions function that we tested earlier and we'll respond to them once the presentations are complete and we'll aim to get through as many of these as we can. First, we'll start off with Bernadette. Bernadette Conant is the Chief Executive Officer of Canadian Water Network. As a trusted knowledge broker, she shares insights with decision makers to accelerate, advance, and improve water management. Bernadette is a co-founder of the Canadian Water Municipal, uh, Municipal Water Consortium, a nationwide collaboration that is shaping a national narrative on critical water challenges. She also serves as Vice Chair of the Global Water Research Coalition Board of Directors. We're also fortunate to be joined today by Carl Yates. Carl has extensive experience in the water utility profession, having served as project engineer, chief engineer, and general manager of the Halifax Water Commission from 1988 to 1996. In 1996, he was appointed general manager of the Halifax Regional Water Commission, known as Halifax Water, which assumed a regional mandate after municipal amalgamation of the greater Halifax area in 96. In 2007, Carl oversaw the formation of the first regulated water, wastewater, and stormwater utility in Canada, with the transfer of wastewater and stormwater assets from the Halifax Regional Municipality. After retirement from Halifax Water in July 2019, he formed his own consulting company to promote and support sustainable water management. He previously served as director of the Water Research Foundation with roles as chair of the Research Advisory Council and Focus Area Council, and chair of the National Research Council and for guide Potable Water Committee. He currently serves as the chair of the Canadian Water Network, board member of the Alliance for Water Efficiency, and director of Operations Without Borders. Thank you both for joining us today. We'll start off by handing things off to Bernadette. Great. Thank you, Juliana, and thank you uh, to everybody for uh, joining. Uh, I think it's great to be here, and I think that we're all learning because this is going to be a big part of, of how we uh, connect more going forward. I think this was one trend we were seeing in the sector, and we're going to see a lot more of it. So thanks, and, and thanks for bearing with us as we go through. So as Juliana said, uh, the project that we undertook at Canadian Water Network was to look at what the trends were in the Canadian municipal water sector, specifically what were the trends in the sector and the drivers for how decisions were being made uh, that would inform the uh, Green Municipal Fund or other projects to really kind of get into a sense of how decisions were being made. And that's very much what we do at uh, Canadian Water Network. So it's really not an organization who's about, here's the latest practice or here's the latest technologies, but how can we deepen our insight about how the sector is moving and how decisions are made and so for us, our corporate goal is to accelerate, advance, and improve water management. So we really look at how do we frame what is known and not known uh, in a way that usually makes decisions truly um, evidence-informed. So this project was very much an extension of that kind of work. Uh, there's more detail of things in the report that uh, Juliana pointed out to you, so I would refer you to the report a little more. Uh, I think maybe this slide uh, might not be in there, just to give you a sense of the demographics of the survey that we did. So I just want to emphasize that this project was about taking our collective knowledge from the Canadian Municipal Water Consortium and Canadian Water Network, and then really bringing in others from outside, but with a focus, we've got a very broad audience um, it, for the webinar today. The focus of this survey was a broader municipal practitioner and particularly senior water managers as opposed to operators 
um, from across the country. And the idea was to test the things that we're seeing, does that resonate for them or do we have some blind spots about what people are doing? And then once we tested that, to dive down to better understand what the trends in their decision making were. So this graph just gives you a sense of a kind of a, of a, it's a balance of uh, different sizes and there was a bit of a balance across um, geographic locations. We put the ask out to about 100 and we got almost a 50% response, which is great for a survey of this. But again, we're not talking about a statistically relevant uh, benchmarking survey. We're talking about an inclus uh, inclusive survey or questionnaire that really helps take the pulse. So I always tell uh, folks that, uh, especially in the science side, that you should start with your last slide first. So one of the key takeaways for much of the discussion and much of what we provided to FCM and the GMF group in our larger report was the importance of understanding the nature of co-benefits when you're designing programs. So for those of you who are used to making skillful business cases for what you do, the concept is not um, strange to you, but it's about having systems that collectively recognize and granting systems and evaluation systems that recognize it's not about one specific goal, it's about how going after one goal uh, can reap those benefits, whether it's financial or at other levels of government. So the idea that you're going after one goal, it might be reduction of greenhouse gas emissions for a federal target, that are lots of things that can do that, that also increase what might be a municipal goal, about a more livable city, about bringing people in connection with water, about creating park space, which also then connects to some very specific goals that uh, water utility might have around sort of stormwater management. So this isn't rocket science, but the idea is how do we actually bring in an expectation of that um, kind of decision making so that by looking for the connection is the thing that we're rewarding in the systems as opposed to it being the uh, um, second, second place finisher, I guess. So what you'll see in the report are what are the sort of five overall trends uh, shaping the water sector. So the idea here is to understand what is the space within which municipal water utilities are working, because that gives us a better sense, just like we try to think about what are the customers thinking about. This is what the providers, their space looks like. This is what is really shaping increasingly the discussions that then result in how they are mandated to do work, to spend money, um, and to make uh, priority decisions. So by understanding that space, kind of brings us into a place where if we're trying to work with them, we're trying to work for them, we're trying to provide a technology or a service product, uh, trying to get into that headspace a bit. So these are the big ones. So financial sustainability, not a new topic we'll talk a little bit more about that but it's it's the fact that the business has to operate in a way that the way and the amount of revenues that you bring in actually properly address the costs and so that's very much what is uh taking up time in the thinking of uh, municipalities and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, the expanding role of water utilities so very much a, a big shift in the last uh 10 years particularly about the expectations of water utilities being a municipal service and compliance organization to an organization that has a key role in a lot of uh, activities and among many of the services has a very much a direct outreach and connection with the uh, customer. So increasingly seen as the role of utilities, they're the ones that are uh, connecting with the customer through questions, through billing, through campaigns. So that's a really big shift for a sector that was designed really on the base of sort of engineering and service delivery as its dominant piece. Uh, changing public expectations, that goes along with that, but a really different world in terms of the public's uh, expectation of, of interaction, of transparency, of data and knowledge access. Another big trend for the sector right now, because they're looking at how do you balance that clear need for uh, transparency and trust with the liability and the security issues that they've also got to maintain. So very much a big piece. Uh, increasing uncertainty, 
pretty clear in the current situation uh, that that uncertainty is there. And actually interesting to, to note that increasing uncertainty is about more than climate change. It's about the uncertainty about your demographics might shift overnight or your activities might shift overnight. And we're certainly seeing that. So we've gone from uh, a sector which was dominated for over 100 years by kind of an engineering mindset, uh, doing things in a certain way, and then um, basically modeling and designing based on past behavior or past performance and then adding a safety factor. Now we've really shifted to it's it's really the outliers and the the rarer but clear events that dominate the costs that dominate the activity. So the whole shift is how do we actually be so you, the words like resilience, uh, redundancy, those are all about dealing with uncertainty and then new technologies. So not only how do we increase them or how do we get people that have data savvy, how do we actually react to the ability to change what went from a no data uh, management and not enough data to all of a sudden a tsunami of data and how do we incorporate those things. So this, these are the kinds of things that the senior management uh, groups are, are dealing with. Um, and those are three steps above getting down to what that scope of work looks like if you're working for them or the, or the, the piece that you're trying to sell them. So this graph, which is in the report, just shows in that survey that I showed the pie graph, we just were really ground truth in these five key trends and we wanted to see whether with those in the survey who weren't part of our core group uh, how did they resonate so we asked four different questions and uh, or maybe it's on the next graph that we consolidated them but what you're seeing here is whether uh, it strongly resonated somewhat resonated or or didn't so you can see on all five of them it either it was dominated by either strongly or somewhat resonating um, and there was no one for whom financial sustainability didn't uh, resonate. So uh, again, I won't go into this in detail. You can look in the report. We gave them 15 uh, decisions to see what objectives were driving decisions. So taking down from the trends, we now started asking, what are your um, current mandates to go do? What are you spending money on right now? What will you be spending money in five years? And what do you hope to spend money on? Um, in the future. And you can see a couple of those graphs in the report. They basically the top five of the actual decision drivers because we went from what are your strategic objectives to what are you actually spending money on now? So that was sort of the truth test. The top five really uh, consolidated into three key topics, adapting, pro, uh, sorry, adopting proactive asset management, financial sustainability issues. So I've talked about that. That's about a combination of reducing operating costs and improving a balanced revenue generation and resilience to uncertainty. Um, and Carl will talk a little bit more about a couple of these is common to all of these drivers was data analytics and the need for um, internal resourcing. And that's both people uh, as well as financing. So just quickly, the asset management, that's a dominant terminology it's a dominant mandate it's a dominant thing that uh, municipalities and utilities across canada are doing what they are trying to do within that space is shift from reactive asset management meaning spending all your time fixing um busted pipes and and, and disaster management and breakage management to a proactive uh approach that that thinks ahead and plans ahead that's really where everybody is uh, strategically collecting using data, uh, correlating how, uh, what condition the asset is into the level of service. So that's recognizing that some pipes might not be in their best uh, condition, but they're not the critical pieces in terms of delivering safe water and what level of service do you really need. So this is about matching priorities to what are the designated needs um, and then connecting to climate change. Reducing operating costs, a lot of that has been focusing on um, managing system leaks, whether it's drinking water systems and, and uh, not losing a, a lot of what the sector refers to as non-revenue water, meaning we spend all this time and effort to treat it so that your small child can drink it filling safely and then uh, lose that from the system and that doesn't, uh, that's not efficient. 
Uh, also, there's increasing uh, reduction of, of leaks from um, wastewater, uh, uh, I and I infiltration into systems that causes costs on uh, treatment. That's another big focus increasingly. Uh, energy efficiency, energy has been one of the largest costs. It recently actually supplanted the costs, uh, the people costs, which had dominated in the past. So every time they increase energy efficiency, that has a big influence uh, and impact on bottom line, um, resource recovery and digitization. So in terms of increasing revenues, I just wanted to point to another report that you can uh, take a look at it's in it that you can download that from the Canadian Water Network website. I think Juliana might be able to give you the link, but just go to the, the website and you'll see it. Much of the discussion in my professional history around water and water municipal water management, so our utility water management, was this sort of narrative about the underpricing of water in Canada. And it was all about just not charging enough. I won't say where that we, certainly rates have gone up. It's not an issue about underpricing the value of water, uh, that's still there. But what's become really evident is the imbalance in the way that water rates are design. So it's much more about our water rates being designed in a way that reflects what the expenditures are. So remember I talked about it's not just financial healthiness, it's financial sustainability. So the balancing the books talks about in that uh, graphic there speaks to the imbalance between the way rates are typically um, done in municipalities where much more of the rate uh, that they charge you is based on on how much water you use. And that was done in, at a time thinking that that was the way that we got people to conserve. But what happens with conservation is they have less revenue coming in. So you're generating a lot of your uh, revenue based on how much water people use. But on the right side, you're seeing the actual costs to, to give you the service that you're looking for are, are fixed. So that um, that's a big uh, imbalance that's spoken to much more in the report here. We're seeing an increase in the number of stormwater utilities where people are trying to generate uh, the costs of, of their stormwater um, impacts on what a utility has to do by, by charging against that and using advanced water metering. Um, maybe what I'll do here, just to give people a chance to feed back, uh, Juliana, I think we had a poll question here, uh, just to see with the, the folks that are online, um, do you, do you know if your municipal water utility where you live, does it base its rate structure on a formal cost of service methodology? And what I mean by that is, does it have a methodology that actually looks to match what they charge you to base the rationale for what they charge the, the customer based on what the actual sort of full costs going forward will be? So looking for you to say, if you know that yes, they have a methodology that seeks to match the costs that they charge you to what the cost of service is. Uh, no, they don't do that, or you don't know. So I guess, Juliana, uh, you want to give people uh, instructions on how they uh, answer the poll? We're just about to close it. So last few seconds, if you wanted to uh, respond. I feel like I should be humming the theme from Jeopardy to help you out there. Okay. Right, okay, thanks for that. So Carl, I'll let you speak to that um, when you get to your piece. That's not, um, that's, that's, that's pretty much in line with what I've seen is the majority aren't uh, sure. Those that, and there's almost a, equal split of, among the informed about those who do and those who don't. So thanks for that, uh, Juliana. We'll, we'll go forward. Just trying to keep an eye on my time, leave for Carl. Um, climate resilient systems, I don't think I need to explain a lot here, but it's certainly a big uh, issue. It's one thing to say we need resilient systems and another thing to figure out what does that look like. So a lot of that has to do with accounting for the greater uncertainty. We used to um, manage for the average and insure for extremes, which were considered sort of rare uh, and force majeure things. Now what we do is say, 
we don't know what the future is going to look like and how do we plan when we can't predict well so instead of saying yep we've got the best model we know how to predict we use the knowledge we have but we're really really taking the grasp of the fact that we don't know what the future might hold and how do we expand a risk management approach so you'll hear a lot going forward about utilities um hand in hand really uh socially or physically distant hand in hand with their utilities taking a risk management approach to prioritizing uh you're seeing an increased focus on stormwater management so floods are not the only thing that we're worried about with extreme events uh certainly with freezing with droughts but a lot of focus on the stormwater piece um, not uh, just because of floods but because stormwater systems uh give back to our systems what we had in more natural systems which is what uh, why uh, green solutions are so popular and that's the ability to, to moderate so everyone in the current pandemic is talking about flattening the curve what you'll see a lot of people online that are working in this area see very much in that discussion is exactly analogous to what we talk about in sort of storm water management it's not about making the uh event not happen it's about spreading out the time and the ability to manage it so you're going to see a lot more of that discussion in the in the resilient systems um, gray and green infrastructure that just speaking to the need to balance uh both um, all the bioswales in the world won't make no flooding happen when we have these huge ninja storms so it's about using uh, the two things together so try to get in the way from the dichotomy of it's we need green solutions or no we need gray solutions because the answer is we need both and sort of active management that goes along with the discussion we had before about being proactive um, as opposed to responding um, so we like to look at it as the opportunities in these trends there's a ton of work and opportunity to do good in terms of uh, building the uh, urban flood resilience through stormwater management uh, tools. Lots and lots of use, and Carl will probably speak more uh, of the new, a lot of the new technology piece is about actually getting us to the space where we can do strategic um, asset planning uh, and the affordability and the ability to use these technologies really putting us on a different footing to be able to do that. So lots happening there. Um, improved system performance so you saw some of the reasons and the drivers there that minimizing system water and energy loss it's something that the sector has some experience with but we can really uh vault ahead in that area and of course one of the really rich ones is the better use of data analytics and improving the data collection management and analysis and so just having more data is not the answer it's really what does it mean so Canadian Water Network's role really at a high level is its curation of what does all this mean at a very operational and, and strategic level. Uh, utilities are trying to look at what data do I use and what can I uh, discern out of the data that I have. And I'm just gonna end uh, here to tell, talk a little bit about uh, much, much of that focus was on the things that are actually driving decisions today and never was it clearer than what was relevant yesterday is already yesterday and we're talking about what's going forward so governance in the broad sense i don't mean just governments i mean the structures around which decisions are made and how they're made uh, to support much more integrated municipal approaches is is uh, sort of the overarching um trend here and uh, carl's definitely a disciple of the fact that if you get the governance right everything else can follow and have a look at these next five because we're going to give you the last poll question i'm curious to see uh of folks on the webinar which ones of these resonate with you most so receiving water quality impacts that's about combined uh sewer overflows or bypasses the issues around nutrients contributing to algal blooms um, uh, pathogens or emerging contaminants so that receiving water quality impacts is uh really raise um emerging in in things that people are having to deal with and 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 setting up task force on uh wastewater resource recovery i want to point out here one of the bigger difference about uh the drivers for resource in the sector in canada versus let's say the us is that outside of some places like uh southern alberta and the okanagan 
and a couple of other places in on average or in most places the actual uh, supply of water isn't the volume of water isn't the fundamental problem it definitely is in some areas but in most places it's not the lack of water like in Australia or southwestern US that's driving this resource recovery it has to do with other drivers and particularly the financial driver and that's important to know in Canada because the solutions may be common to other areas, but the reasons that people would want to em uh, employ them are, are different. So we're seeing a lot more interest in how to fit the waste resource recovery uh, possibilities into this um, financial sustainability, as well as things like a, a achieving goals like greenhouse gas reduction, et cetera. Uh, customer driven water services, we talked about that. that that's a huge uh, up and comer in terms of how do you actually shift the way that uh, utilities work to hear what customers want and, and see them as, as the drivers for the decision. Uh, Carl will speak to cybersecurity during, due to growing digitization. That's pretty clear that that's, that's a big one um, and increasingly of concern. And then the last, and I'll just end off with the one that, that in my mind is probably one of the fastest moving and most important ones, and it came out number 15 of 15 in the current drivers, and that's equity and affordability and service delivery. So you're seeing discussions uh, about that going on in rates. You're seeing discussions now in the pandemic about, uh, about reconnecting um, people with water. This is a huge, I would tell you a year from now, this will, if we have this webinar again, this will definitely be a bigger piece. So maybe I'll just end that then, Julianne, with if you could do the other poll. Just really interested to hear from folks on the webinar. Um, just pick one. It's, this is just to give us a sense which of these, if you had to pick one, would you see as the top emerging driver? And I would ask you to answer it in the way that you think it is, not what you think it should be, but what you think is coming. So we're looking for your collective insights into, into uh, what the emerging uh, decision drivers are. And while they're doing that, Carl, I, I'm gonna yield some of uh, what I said earlier about trying to get done early to give Carl lots of time. Uh, I can see I'm a, a couple of minutes over time, so my apologies to you. Great, so, oh look, I talked people into equity and service delivery, no, so uh, receiving impacts, number one, uh, equity, really great. So yeah, so we'll, I think Juliana has spoke to that, we'll capture some of the outputs of this and um, hopefully that'll lead into the Q&A, but my goal is, is to make this part of, as we always do, the ongoing discussion, so great to see um, some of those. So thanks for that, Juliana. Um, and so with that, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity. It was a great project, a really welcome project for Canadian Water Network, because this is exactly the kind of piece that we're um, trying to do. And I'm, I'm going to pass it over to Carl, but, I, but at first I want to say I got to give a, a, a cheers to all the water uh, people that keep your water going out there. I've, my quote I often say is, if you want to know who the most important public health worker in your community is, it's the person that looks after your water and wash your hands. So with that, we'll turn it over to Carl. Thanks, Bernadette. Uh, these were some really great insights and I'm looking forward to delving into the Q&A period. So Carl, we've passed control over to you, so you should be good to go. Thank you very much and uh, welcome everybody to our, our webinar this afternoon and uh, in these trying times. So uh, I'm pleased to uh, be able to uh, work with you today in self-isolation. So I've got another few days before I can come up uh, for air. So uh, part of the current situation we're in. Um, I'm gonna try to converge with some of the ideas that uh, Bernadette mentioned. And uh, what I'm gonna show you is kind of five things to watch, uh, I suggest from a utility perspective. And I should come clean to say I had the opportunity to uh, do a presentation last fall uh, at the Atlantic Canada Water Wastewater Association where they asked me to look to the future, what uh, they saw where trends were coming. So I did this actually before CWN actually did their national uh, polling. So it's gonna be interesting to see the uh, convergence with uh, some of the ideas that I, I shared at, uh, at that time. So there they are, this is last fall when I when I was looked at this, just retired as general manager of Halifax Water. 
And I said, these are five things to watch for, data analytics and artificial intelligence, cyber threats. And I was very curious to see only 2% said this was a big issue. And that, that means something right there. Uh, social disruption, we're seeing that today, uh, smart devices, and I call not climate change, but climate crises. So jumping in with the data analytics and the artificial intelligence in the past, and Bernadette mentioned this, we're often looking you know, back at what's happened in the past to try to predict what's gonna happen in the future. But now we're gonna rely more on algorithms and self-learning to really try to predict what might happen uh, uh, based on, uh, on what we can uh, see now looking through the windshield instead of looking in the rearview mirror. So it's a, it's, a, it's a changing time and we expect this is gonna progress very rapidly in the in next few years. Uh, advanced media infrastructure is gonna bring a fundamental relationship change to the utility and its customers. This is for mutual gains. The utility is gonna get a lot of good information about its customer base. It's gonna be much better to use for water loss control and the customer can really um, now take advantage of seeing their consumption in very close to real time. We always said, you know, it's good we could modify our customer's behavior, but in this case, it's gonna be opportunities for the customers to modify their own behavior. So once they see their, their water usage, and as I sometimes jokingly say, uh, the customer now will know when the in-laws moved in and when the in-laws moved out. All you do is check their uh, water consumption uh, from this system. We're gonna see a lot more convergence of data with all the different, uh, what used to be silos, but they're gonna be coming together and integrated. We've got computerized maintenance management systems. We've got geographic information systems. We've got SCADA systems. We've got data historians. We've got all kinds of extraneous data from satellite imagery, weather, traffic, and all kinds of customer calls coming to our call center and any other monitoring gadget you can imagine. So in the future, all of these are gonna to come together to help us make better predictive uh, decisions for the utility. Cyber threats, um, again, I'm surprised that only 2% named that. Uh, this is a big issue and uh, we're seeing it in many different uh, aspects of our society. Uh, I talk about cryptocurrency um, here actually in Atlantic Canada in our backyard here in Fall River, I have one of the most famous uh, disruptions of, of the financial systems with a collapse of a uh, cryptocurrency. And uh, you're gonna see lots of issues, I think continue around that as it continues to challenge the central banking system for dominance. There's a lot of other threats to watch out for. We, we take for granted our e-transfers and you probably did a few today yourself and you're gonna do more in the next little while to pay your bills. But uh, unless you've got double authentication, uh, you are definitely at risk. So uh, it'll be interesting to see if there's some, some unscrupulous people that will take advantage of that in the next uh, little while. Identity theft is real. Um, there was a big breach, of course, of MasterCard not that long ago, and it wasn't just that you can find they had your MasterCard number. They were able to get a lot of other things that go with that, uh, things that you, when you made your application for MasterCard, including social security numbers and uh, dates of birth and, and phone numbers and all of that. So there's, uh, there's a lot more out there now uh, besides a risk to finances. And of course, the Internet of Things, we, we know now that uh, you know, the fridges and barbecues are coming smart. And uh, we had to watch out for people trying to uh, get into your systems through that IP address, which is often just factory set and never changed. And I know that, you know, we're all looking forward to a barbecue and tell us when we can flip the steak over, but we're not careful that can also infiltrate into our own uh, computer systems within the house. For me, I think it's personally, I'm, I'm uh, affronted by the concept of somebody telling me when to turn over my steak. That is a front to my manhood. So I would not want that sort of thing. Uh, and ransomware, that's hitting the news big time. Um, every sector has been hit with it. Water utilities, universities, municipalities, um, and uh, some have been uh, you know, losing their data entirely. Some have paid fees and some have done nothing. And uh, you know, there's, there's a lot out there on that. And of course, our uh, public services can say we should not pay for, uh, for uh, the, the ransom demanded. Um, we're seeing uh, our SCADA systems intruded, and sometimes it's for, I guess, evil purposes to actually control operations. We've seen where sometimes gates uh, have been opened uh, remotely uh, through uh, intrusion, but also we've seen a few cases where people have tried to go in to get at those powerful servers that operate the, uh, the PLCs in your treatment plant, not to do anything, should we say, to manipulate the operation, but to steal this computing power to calculate uh, cryptocurrency uh, uh, calculations. So that's uh, an interesting one uh, 
to say the least, because uh, cryptocurrency does require a lot of computing power. So that's real, that's happened. Uh, I won't tell you which uh, treatment plants that's happened at, but uh, Halifax Water was uh, is, is um, enrolled in the uh, Water ISEC, which gives us updated information uh, from America in particular, and uh, these things have happened. Social disruption, no question. We're gonna see uh, a lot more of that. This is like the 60s all over again, for those of you uh, who uh, saw the 60s and the up uprisings uh, associated with it and the changing of norms. Uh, we're already seeing lots of um, action around climate change, uh, a lot more protesting, a lot more very uh, you know direct action uh, taking place across our country and, and other countries. Customer service demands are growing exponentially. The customer um, has a lot more information at their fingertips. Some of it is good information, some is not, but nonetheless, I uh, use the saying, I Google, therefore I am. And they believe that they should be able to get anything from a, uh, a water utility as a result. Uh, affordability that um, Bernadette mentioned, there's no question as water rates are going up and they need to go up uh, in terms of uh, sustainability, you're gonna see more tailored programs or you should see more tailored programs to low income households. We gotta make sure the most vulnerable of our populations still have access to really a uh, fundamental service for their public health and sanitation. Uh, a breakdown in social norms, and we're, we're certainly seeing that with, uh, with social media being pervasive in our society. There's a lot more vitriol. We're not as kind to one another, and that's, that's unfortunate to say the least. But I always tell everybody to take a deep breath uh, and be kind. So uh, let's hope that that continues certainly in the next few months as we're, we're challenged as a society. Last one, fake news and misinformation. I used the example last fall about the measles and how uh, unfortunate it is that people don't get their kids vaccinated. And here now we're in front of us with uh, the COVID uh, outbreak and we're seeing tremendous misinformation and, and it, which is quite dangerous. Uh, and that in, in a lot of cases, and we might as well name it in America where initially uh, this was not taken as seriously as, as it should have been. And uh, as a result, I think there will be implications. So that will be uh, huge uh, in our society on, on a go forward basis, uh, the manipulation of, of information through digital means. And smart devices, um, we're gonna see a proliferation uh, in our society um, and they're gonna be fed from the three Vs. We're gonna see a lot more data, no question. It's gonna be coming at us faster and it's gonna be coming more accurate. Well, that's kind of good at least, at least it's coming more accurate for a change, uh, but they're gonna feed uh, a lot of the, the smart devices and it's going to be, a, I guess, an iterative loop for a long time uh, uh, and probably will never, ever settle. Um, smart pipes and appurtenances, what I mean there is um, the pipes and appurtenances are, are going to come smart. A lot of times we're looking back and putting instrument, instrumentation um, on existing equipment. Uh, the future says it's coming with its own uh, smart devices built in. So that's, that's a good thing. And again, the data analytics and artificial intelligence will continue to feed those smart devices and then you're going to need even smarter devices and then you're going to need more data analytics and artificial intelligence and it's just going to continue to cycle until we come out with uh, some very uh i guess uh, um, opportunistic moments for our society to really take advantage and really get into uh, predictive decision making and you've heard this one before i mean even 10 years ago we wouldn't predicted some of the jobs we currently see today watch out in 10 years time again you're going to see some very strange job descriptions that you never thought were, were possible. And uh, to talk about climate, um, there's no question that we're gonna see much more action there. Um, I've, I've got the bullet here that the, the environment is gonna take center stage. And I, you know, I, I kind of say ahead of economics, but the reason I say ahead of economics because without the environment, there is no economics. And you're gonna see a lot of the decisions coming from the insurance sector. And we are already seeing it today. The insurance sector sometimes is looking ahead. They see risk quicker than uh, the broader sector does. And they will start taking action to drive uh, businesses and, uh, and societies uh, in certain areas. And uh, I guess to put a damper on things, you know, it's, it's change or perish. And this is what really was published through the Intergovernmental uh, Panel on Climate Change. I made it very clear we're at a critical juncture here. We have we have an opportunity to, to change our ways and uh, and really think about intergenerational equity and, and try not to screw the grandkids. That's really what this is about. Um, so if you had grandchildren, I do. So I am very concerned that we we, we leave them something that they can live with. Um, the water energy nexus is is a great opportunity for everybody to really 
and uh, make a difference. And I challenge everybody that's on this call today to go back to your own municipalities and uh, and look at the water cycle as, as really a transmission of energy and see where along the cycle uh, energy can be harnessed and, uh, and generated. Um, Wastewater is a misnomer, and, uh, and I'm glad to see that with Bernadette's uh, study. Really, there's tremendous resource uh, in, in wastewater. You can you know, mine methane from it. You can use the biosolids for nutrient enrichment or, or again, for, for energy. You can use uh, sewage heat recovery for, for uh, uh, district energy heating. There's just so much you can do with wastewater that uh, we really have just started to tap. And last but not least, we need to do both in terms of climate change. We must mitigate and adapt. There's a lot of switching lately to talk about adaptation, but I don't think we should let go of mitigation either. And the good news is you can do both, especially as a municipal water, wastewater, or stormwater utility. And two of my favorites, because they approach both mitigation and adaptation, are water loss control and inflow and infiltration reductions. Both of those are gems to reduce energy and, 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 uh, and wastage of a resource, and at the same time, reduce energy associated uh, with the transmission of, of those effluents. So just tremendous. Uh, it's really the low hanging fruit for, uh, for any uh, utility. So with that, that kind of wraps up, um, I guess, my perspective. Um, and I'm very pleased to, to see many of uh, these thoughts converge with the, uh, the national poll. And I think we're ready now to uh, hopefully take a few questions uh, from our attendees today. Thank you so much, Carl. I think you provided some really interesting insights into how municipalities are able to drive change. And thank you again to Bernadette as well. We're looking forward to going through some of the questions from the participants. So we have about 10, 12 minutes remaining to tackle questions in the chat functions. So I'd like to remind speakers to answer relatively briefly to allow for as many as possible. So there was a question that I'll direct to Bernadette about uh, the survey responses from the research, uh, but I'll also uh, take on Carl's two cents on this topic. So somebody asked about whether a lack of control for municipalities was raised as a concern due to utility boards making decisions without necessarily consulting with municipalities. So an example they provided was a directive to municipalities to, for example, not operate in deficits, which would in turn increase customer rates drastically. Right, so um, yes, thanks for that. Thanks for the question. So we, I'd have to go back and look at the way that we did the, the, the survey questions and, and look at that. And, which reminds me, I need to do a shout out to Kim Jusik, who's on the Canadian Water Network team. The whole team put it together. She did the lion's share of, of, of putting this work together and, and can help you with that. But I would say we, we put the issues of governance and part of governance is the degree to which decision-making is fact-based and, and allowed um, to be made without political interference. That element came into a few of the questions. That's always part of the discussion. And so uh, I, I want to keep it brief. I would say there's a complex answer to that. So yes, in some cases, there are um, unintended consequences. There are restrictions, and Carl maybe could speak to it initially on the lead issue, restrictions in the revenues that they generated, how they could use that to address problems, even though it was cl a clear way forward to them, it was seen as cross-subsidizing, which they weren't allowed to do. So uh, in my view, most of these are, they're not, they're problematic just because they're unintended rather than sort of malfeasance uh, kinds of things. Uh, the other thing that comes a lot across a lot is the different um, structures we have in Canada. They vary a lot across municipalities, but it's by far and away their public systems. So the degree to which sort of political, um, issues and counselors questions and redirections and priorities uh, um, complicate things is, is clearly an issue. So people didn't say that was a separate issue. We didn't ask it that way, but it was clearly part of their challenges. Great, thank you for offering that perspective. Uh, Carl, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, certainly, you know, with regard to governance, um, I think, um, most utilities work very closely with their uh, elected officials uh, uh, where they can, and I think that will continue. That being said, there are often times when uh, 
the autonomy of a water utility can um, make a more longer term decision. And I think uh, we've seen that a lot, of a lot of times when you look at assets that have a life cycle of 75 to 100 years, but politicians, of course, we recognize get elected every four years. So there's a, sometimes a disconnect between a long-term decision uh, in the interests of, I guess, uh, intergenerational equity. One of the things that, that we often see is, is actually beneficial for utilities in that regard is to be regulated. And in Nova Scotia, uh, utilities are regulated by the Nova Scotia Utility Review Board in the same way that in many uh, provinces, your electricity rates or your gas rates are regulated uh, because that forces a lot more discipline uh, and forces intergenerational equity, that one generation is not sacrificed uh, for the next. So I actually think it's a, it's a positive thing when uh, there is a uh, quasi-judicial regulator to uh, enforce um, you know, a stringent approach uh, to a water utilities uh, decision-making. Great, so, that's Juliana, a point really going, well taken. Sorry, Julianne, as you're going to the next question, I'll just add a quick coda to that and to say, um, without sort of naming the u u utilities, you, some of you probably live there, the example, the kind of concrete examples of the challenges is a couple of municipalities that have tried a couple of times to get stormwater fees in, and that's been shot down by council. Or we had a much more recent one where there was a, a utility put forward uh, an equity um, affordability program that they thought would answer the city's priorities, and it was seen as too progressive and, and shot down. So that's clearly in those sort of concrete examples. Uh, things are changing. If you brought them back today, they might be different, but that's that's very much a matter of of, of how our systems work. Great, thank you both. Um, we have another question to, for Carl um, about AI. So how, based on some of your experiences, how would you envision the interactive impacts between artificial intelligence application and municipal water utilities staff experience within operations? Well, I think they can be complementary. Um, I think certainly from my experience, uh, a lot of utility operators have uh, a good knowledge of, of you know, the different information that's available to them. What's missing often is seeing it in one central kind of location. So I think with a lot of these systems, uh, and I mentioned the word central event management in the future, you're going to kind of see more of a, a dashboard on, the, I guess, the computer screens of the operators that currently have these screens today, of course, uh, in, their, in their pickup trucks. But you're going to see, I think, an opportunity to really have a nice desktop where these can be synthesized and put in a more uh, easy to, to see manner. And therefore, people are going to be able to look for the anomalies that they didn't see before. In other words, they might have these different kind of uh, siloed information sets that individually they might not see trends, but you bring it together with artificial intelligence and all of a sudden these anomalies are framed for the operator to see. And I think with that, I think those operators are going to uh, take full advantage. But I think there's enough certainly uh, knowledge and ability with operators today, but in some cases there will also need to be some uh, additional training to make sure people are comfortable with the, the smart tools that they're given. And any progressive utility is starting to do that today and really recognize that to make sure that people are giving training and 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 basically, in particular in the transition period, really have people available to to work with them, make sure they're comfortable with the new technology. So I think that's uh, that's going to happen, and I think we're going to eventually get comfortable with it. Absolutely. It's a complementary relationship in the making. So another question from Bernadette relating to the research. We have on the line with us today a wide range of municipalities, ranging from small rural ones to larger cities. Did you notice anything in the research that, or any highlights where there were differences between these types of demographics and sizes of, of, of municipalities? Yeah, sure. Great, great question. So first, let me let me start by saying um, what we did was not a statistically powerful um, survey that I could sort of tease out, uh, sort of an evidence-based answer to that question. It's absolutely important for people to understand that. But I can tell you what we saw um, from that survey and what it tells us about uh, what we do see, and that is clearly, you know, big cities versus small cities have uh, different challenges. They have 
huge resource challenges. And again, I don't just mean um, the money, I mean the people, the expertise, and just sort of the emotional and, and time bandwidth. One for Canadian Water Networks Municipal Consortium, uh, one of the biggest challenges we have with smaller municipalities is not that they don't see the same value, but they just don't have the ability and bandwidth to interact. But what I would say, uh, yes, they have differences between, um, you know, Ontario, if you're on the Great Lakes, if you're in the Okanagan, you've got uh, very different issues. If you're in Regina, your wastewater is basically uh, making up the stream as opposed to somebody in Montreal who's discharging to uh, the St. Lawrence. So the contexts are really different. Big is different than small, but maybe the one thing I would leave with you that, that I found is they all face almost exactly the same challenges. They just have different responses. So best management practice, best technique, that varies. So they all have different priorities, but really the challenges are faced, the same challenges facing everybody. It's the what's the right response for that community. That's the thing that's different. So I would, to me, that's more the take home than um, any kind of trends within that, that small data set. Yeah, that's a really good point and really applicable across different sectors as well. So thank you. So we have a few more minutes. I'm just going to ask one closing questions. And um, if you could please both share your thoughts, that would be really great. Um, could you speak a little bit? We were talking a lot about financial sustainability earlier. Other than rate changes, do you know any other mechanisms that utilities have to increase their fiscal sustainability? Uh, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I'm going to ask Carl. I'm going to yeah. ask Carl to do that because uh, he's got lots of examples. So uh, age before beauty, honey. <laughs> well, there's lots of opportunities for for water utility besides uh, generating revenue from rates. Uh, I mentioned, of course, about the water energy nexus in particular. There's a great opportunity for utilities to take advantage of of uh, what's in front of them to generate additional revenue. And uh, I guess you know, if I use examples, I can I can take you from the watershed right to the discharge uh, into the uh, Atlantic Ocean about things that uh, Halifax Water has done and what other utilities can do. Uh, starting at the watershed, wind turbines up on the watershed to generate electricity and bring in revenue. Um, you know, when you have a good wind profile, why not? So you can start right there. Um, within the treatment plants themselves, you can look at all kinds of energy efficiency upgrades. There's many programs available now where you can take full advantage to reduce your costs. Uh, but also to, you know, even generate uh, electricity. Um, in the Halifax water situation, for instance, they actually have an inline turbine downstream of the treatment plant that actually generates electricity, feeds it back into the grid, and makes money for the utility. So uh, it's on regulated revenue, which is not a bad thing. Um, it can be used then to uh, seed other projects to, uh, to uh, generate revenue. Um, the utility is putting in solar panels. Believe it or not, Halifax has got a decent... Uh, solar profile. So great opportunity again to, to generate uh, revenue or, or reduce uh, reduce costs. Um, when you look at uh, the wastewater side, just again, tremendous opportunities for, for resource recovery. Uh, biosolids, uh, either using it for uh, enrichment of soils or using it to produce energy, both those are, are on the table very clearly. Um, using wastewater effluent as uh, for heat recovery, uh, this has been done in many northern countries, uh, uh, certainly in you know Norway, Finland, and Sweden. They're doing it quite extensively, and God bless us, even in Canada now, we're starting to do it. We all know uh, in um, Falls Creek in Vancouver, there's a good example. They've done it. Uh, there's a lot more happening now around this area. Halifax Water is about to do it as well with the, um, the main plant downtown Halifax. There's going to be new development around it, so tremendous opportunity to use that as your heat source and, uh, and generate additional revenues. Um, there's just no wind when you look at the water cycle, what the opportunities are. Uh, I also mentioned, of course, water loss control it was one thing to do it uh, you know, good yourself, but if you're really good at it, you can also consult and go make money from a consulting branch of the utility. There are utilities doing exactly that. You can, you've got expertise, you don't have to you know, hide your light under a bushel, you can go out and, and expand that and, and help others and make money from it. So um, all you've got to do is, is look. Another one um, I've seen lots of utilities uh, do, and this is pretty obvious when you think about uh, the construction of um, reservoirs are always uh, 
on high ground. You know, we always take the saying, the utilities take the high ground for a good reason. They like uh, reservoirs uh, throughout the municipalities uh, on the highest land they can find. It's also a great place to construct telecommunication towers. So many utilities yeah. have been leasing space for those telecommunication towers and making good money uh, to house those telecommunication uh, facilities. And also, I'll, I'll, I'll say, uh, in the case of Halifax Water, not only do they make money from it, they also insist on taking the top of the tower for their own telecommunication needs. So, you know, you can really uh, look at many aspects of a water utility and see there's just nothing but potential everywhere you look. Yeah, it seems like it. You've provided a, a nice range of techniques for people to add to their toolbox. So thanks for providing that that overview. I think it's a great uh, way to actually close today. So we're, we're out of time. We're going to wrap up questions here. So I would encourage those whose questions we weren't able to address in the time to directly reach out to Bernadette and Carl and not we'll try to reach out to you. It was a really engaging session. So thank you again to Bernadette and Carl for taking the time to join us. A few other items before we close. First, I'd just like to add one more key takeaway about our funding. So our funding in the waste stream is available to all municipal governments and their partners. We provide grants for studies and pilots and a combination of loans and grants for capital projects. GMF actually has four categories of projects that we fund. The first one is in water conservation where there are two separate categories. At the municipal level, we fund retrofit initiatives that reduce a municipal building's potable water use by at least 40%. And at the community level, we also fund retrofit initiatives that have the potential to reduce potable water use by at least 20% in a neighborhood facility or group of facilities. Our second category is for stormwater quality. So we again have a different um, set of criteria according to the scale. At the municipal level, we fund initiatives that can help municipalities remove 80% of total suspended solids or a significant amount of other contaminants like E. coli, salt, or grease from a private or public site stormwater runoff. At the community level, we fund initiatives that allow community to remove 60% of total suspended solids um, or a significant amount of, of the contaminants like I mentioned earlier. Our third is for initiatives um, that have innovative wastewater treatment systems. So the solution or approach that you propose must meet your provincial regulatory requirements here. And the last one is for initiatives that capture and treat all wastewater in a target area to at least secondary standards using septic system technologies. One last thing that I'll mention is um, our newer signature initiatives category, which is designed to accommodate transformative best-in-class municipal projects that wouldn't necessarily fit into these four other categories. So these types of initiatives are actually evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. So please reach out to an advisor to find out more information. We have the contact on the screen. It's gmfinfo at fcm.ca. And before you go, just a quick reminder to to please fill out a short two minute survey about the webinar. It's a really important tool for us to help target our next initiatives so that it really meets your interest and needs. So again, a major thank you to Bernadette and Carl and for all of you to have joined us today. I encourage you to please stay safe and healthy in these times and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you and have a good afternoon. Thanks to uh, the FCM team and you, Juliana. Thanks for the opportunity to be part of it.